checking in. All right. So welcome to the session number seven of the e-learning series hosted by NIUA and WRI India. Uh, this session is on inclusive climate action planning. Uh, so the objective of the session is to basically provide an introduction on how uh, our cities can mainstream climate action uh, in planning processes and present a methodology uh, to develop a climate action plan. So in, in our cities, it has, it has become very important that we uh, consider climate impacts in our uh, city master plans in uh, the growth strategies that we are making. So today we have two um, very eminent um, uh, panelists with us, um, Mr. Nikhil Kolse Patil and Mr. Chirag Kajar. And uh, uh, Mr. Nikhil is, uh, he uh, works as a senior manager for energy and climate mitigation program at ICLE South Asia. He has a decade of experience in the areas of renewable energy and energy efficiency climate change, urban sustainability, and green growth. He has supported more than 30 city and state governments in South Asian and Southeast Asian region through various projects and initiatives across these areas, specifically with a focus on GHG emission inventories and climate action planning. He's also a certified urban GHG inventory specialist um, under the World Bank's City Climate uh, Planner Certificate Program. Uh, our second panelist, um, Mr. Chirag Gajar uh, heads the Subnational Climate Action in Climate Program at WRI India. Uh, he oversees um, uh, work related to climate mitigation initiatives and uh, uh, expanding on uh, topics related to national, subnational, and corporate climate strategies. Uh, he has uh, he oversees the work of a team that aims to catalyze and support climate action by states cities and businesses for the coming years. He has uh, been working to promote solutions to climate change for more than 15 years. And he also has a background in carbon market projects under various mechanisms. Uh, he's also a well-known expert in GHG accounting and inventory. I welcome both the panelists. Um, Nikhil, we will start with a brief presentation from your end, oh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ankita. Yeah, I believe my screen is visible. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, and welcome uh, to everyone. Glad to have this opportunity. Uh, so I'll be just taking you to a quick presentation to just give glimpses of uh, how cities have done climate action planning and also uh, broadly in India, a process adopted. So we'll get right into the presentation. Uh, uh, I am from Italy, South Asia. We are basically a city-based network uh, which works through programs and projects uh, to support uh, cities across the world. And my office especially uh, specifically supports South, in, South Asian cities uh, on areas of urban sustainability and climate change. Uh, so coming to the topic, uh, so what does really climate resilience mean? Uh, so climate resilience essentially uh, includes actions which uh, address both actions or strategies which addresses both climate mitigation as well as adaptation. Uh, in terms of mitigation actions, these essentially are actions uh, you know which uh, which help reduce energy use, uh, let's say from our various buildings, from transport, and so on. Uh, adaptation actions refer to any actions uh, which already help us deal with you know impacts which are already being seen in the cities or uh, they are envisaged in the near term so for example how do we uh, build our buildings or construct our buildings in such a manner that uh, the occupants uh, find it comfortable given uh, rising temperatures in cities or heat waves that we see uh, so a key uh, Key aspect of this uh, process, or you know, or doing this or planning for this, is really that all the strategies and actions they should also be inclusive of different groups, and they should focus on uh, vulnerable groups, which uh, typically are uh, you know more affected by climate change and its impacts. <clears throat> uh, so there are a number of uh, 
you know, all the typical sectors, urban sectors, they provide opportunities for climate action or uh, to integrate climate strategies, be it uh, transportation, uh, the way uh, we utilize lands, uh, land and its use, uh, also buildings, uh, infrastructure such as water supply, uh, drainage, so, uh, sewerage, solid waste management. Uh, in recent times, also health uh, is also emerging as a uh, critical area along with urban greening. Uh, and of course, finance is required to implement all these actions and awareness is required so that the community and citizens uh, can adopt uh, and increase uptake of uh, such actions and strategies. Uh, so in Indian cities, uh, there are cities in India which actually have developed full-scale uh, multi-sector action plans on climate change. Uh, the four cities uh, indicated here, uh, they do have uh, action plans uh, which address climate adaptation and mitigation. So these are resilience action plans. Uh, also, all these action plans have been approved formally by the municipal uh, councils in the four cities. Uh, so in these cities, uh, these action plans, they uh, identify and recommend actions uh, across various sectors, uh, like the ones we saw in the previous slides. Uh, they also set specific targets, uh, quantitative targets uh, for emission reduction uh, within a particular time frame. Also, a key point is that uh, uh, it's commendable that these four cities, uh, they also have shown commitment in terms of uh, allocating budget in their municipal, uh, you know, allocating finances under their municipal budget for these climate actions. So in a way, uh, the climate action plan, it's not just a document in these cities. These cities have already incorporated uh, the actions and uh, strategies in their planning framework and also in the um, municipal budgetary cycle. Uh, yeah, so uh, in the next few slides, uh, I'll just share uh, briefly a method uh, methodology and the process that has been adopted in these cities uh, this is the climate resilient cities uh, methodology this has been developed uh, by my organization uh, ICLE, uh, given our uh, work with various cities in the region and uh, globally uh, for two decades or so uh, so this uh, this is typically uh, like most planning uh, processes or methodologies. Uh, this includes three phases, which is analyze, act, accelerate. So analyze essentially includes, uh, you know, understanding the current situation, identifying gaps and opportunities. Act implies that we look at uh, what actions or measures can be taken, then we detail them out and we implement them. And accelerate implies that, uh, you know, we share knowledge and then we again take stock and review and we uh, further scale up our actions or ambition. Uh, so just quickly going to go through the three phases and uh, more so the key steps. Uh, the first phase is analyze. So your uh, critical starting point is getting commitment from, uh, you know, high uh, from the decision makers in the municipal corporations or the cities. So either the commissioner or the mayor. So this sets a clear directive uh, to various departments that you know they can. Uh, the city is committed to uh, undertaking this process of climate action planning and then further implementing these actions. Uh, there is also a key step uh, in terms of institutionalization of these uh, and in involving stakeholders. Uh, this uh, process then results in. Uh, identifying climate risks and you know assessing the city's current services and infrastructure with uh, with respect to climate change from a climate lens as such and then uh, looking at uh, how were the impacts of various uh, climate vulnerabilities which urban systems and infrastructure are at risk uh, and also in terms of the GAG emissions inventory is also another output uh, so key step really that cities uh, that have undertaken climate action planning and also implemented it successfully is that uh, there is a dedicated resource and team that uh, that drives this process right from formulation of actions to implementation and also to monitoring the process uh, also a key point is that a climate core team essentially is established in the city so this is basically consisting of uh, various uh, departments from the cities uh, 
uh, and this helps really uh, to bring in expertise from their sector and also uh, it helps because uh, the department representatives or heads they would know that uh, you know which are the ongoing projects where there are opportunities uh, to integrate climate actions or climate elements uh, where are the where's the financing and funding coming from uh, under various schemes uh, from the state and national government uh, a key aspect is also to engage various stakeholder groups uh, because this helps to engage uh, stakeholders and bring in local knowledge into the process. So typically in the cities, uh, stakeholders are engaged through larger workshops. Uh, typically two to three workshops are held. And in the first workshop, uh, they are informed that the city is keen to undertake climate action planning to initiate it. And then the inputs are taken uh, at various stages from the baseline assessment also, uh, then further on to identification of uh, what actions are possible. Uh, this is a key step because it helps to get their buy-in right from the beginning and also uh, to, you know, uh, because essentially the success is also dependent on uh, them adopting these actions and uh, in the local context, how ready are people to, uh, you know, undertake, for example, uh, to take on public transport in certain areas, to have pedestrianization in certain areas and so on. Uh, so again, glimpses of uh, the key output. So like I said, the first in this, as a result of this first phase, uh, we'll get a city profile, uh, which, which is analyzed from the climate angle. So for example, this helps uh, to identify linkages. Uh, so for instance, uh, if in a city we see that uh, there's a gap in solid waste management and there's littering of solid waste uh, in and around, you know, the drains and the natural channels, uh, then this poses a risk because in high intensity, in incidences of high intensity rainfall, uh, there is a risk of flooding uh, and water logging, especially if uh, in low lying areas where this might be happening uh, and there is a lack of drainage net network there as well. Uh, a key uh, output is also on the right hand side at the bottom, uh, a vulnerability assessment or mapping where for each of the urban sectors, uh, ward at ward level, uh, these are mapped against various climate risks like, uh, you know, uh, water scarcity, for example, high intensity rainfall, uh, rising temperatures, and so on. Uh, and then all these maps are combined, they're overlain, and uh, the city then gets a full picture of, you know, uh, spatially at which locations, which urban sectors and services are getting impacted by climate change and then they can take focused actions. Uh, another key output is the JG emission inventory, which of course looks at various emission sources and energy use and what options are there for action. Uh, the second uh, step is to take action. So uh, this essentially involves identifying what measures can be taken up. Uh, so coming up with a long list of measures, uh, then prioritizing these uh, based on the city's resources and uh, you know local conditions priorities. Uh, further on, then these are uh, combined from various sectors to uh, then identify targets, and uh, then they are implemented. They're detailed out. Uh, some solutions will be pilot tested. Then there will also be structures for monitoring uh, of these actions and so on. A key, uh, so again, glimpses of, uh, you know, uh, how or what aspects should cities look at? Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, identifying intervention, so this is typically done for all sectors. Uh, and uh, again, across sectors, there would be multiple options. So for example, if you want to address the water supply or water sector, uh, we can take actions, you know, actions such as uh, rooftop harvesting, rainwater harvesting, or uh, we can also take other actions in terms of uh, improving the pipe network so that there is uh, less leakage, or we can also install, uh, you know, advanced systems like SCADA and so on. So such actions are listed down and then based on the prioritization and feasibility, uh, technical, political, and also financial, and how quickly these can be implemented and uh, how quickly they deliver impacts. So this is assessed and then they can be prioritized. Uh, again, this step, a key point is to aim for infrastructure actions and also uh, other soft measures, which are related to policy and capacity building. Uh, 
through this process uh, so cities have also the cities which have implemented and pro, uh, developed climate action plans they have uh, involved climate core team uh, within the corporation and also the stakeholder groups to you know validate this prioritization and to gain their uh, local knowledge as well uh, so that what is selected as actions uh, and the scale as well that is realistic and it's practical and the chances of adoption are high <clears throat> uh, a key step to ensure that uh, all these actions uh, don't just you know remain as actions on document but they are actually implemented is to uh, link these two city programs and schemes uh, you know so the city uh, so as much as possible uh, if they are actually included in planning for programs and schemes, uh, the success rate is higher. So, for example, uh, if there is a scheme on uh, affordable housing, so in, including uh, rooftop rainwater solutions or maybe uh, simple green building elements such as, you know, uh, increased ventilation in buildings, designing buildings in that manner. Uh, so in that process, uh, these can already be included. These actions can be included and demonstrated in ongoing work that the city has. <clears throat> the last uh, step is, uh, you know, of course, implementing and piloting solutions. Uh, so this is just a, a, an example of Thani, how Thani is uh, working on uh, it's implemented uh, sensors uh, to uh, as part of an early warning system uh, across the city on a pilot scale. So these sensors, uh, essentially, when there is high tide and there is high intensity rainfall, uh, the city is able to get uh, get early warnings, uh, maybe around 20 to 25 uh, minutes in advance uh, for incidences of water logging and flooding. And of course, uh, such solutions then need to be monitored and they can be scaled up appropriately. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. That was a very interesting presentation. And thank you for taking us through the methodology of how you have uh, gone ahead and prepared the climate action plan for those four cities. Uh, I would like. I would now like to invite Mr. Chirag to uh, present um, his work on the same. I hope my screen is visible and um, audible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, CQ and IUA. Uh, and Ankita for inviting me to speak here. Uh, in fact, sorry about the background noise, I can't control it. Uh, but um, Nikhil's presentation uh, has helped me a lot. Uh, I think I can skip some of the slides or maybe cut short on the presentation of some of these things. But let me try to provide what we've been doing with some of the cities, Indian cities, uh, while helping them develop their own climate action plan these are some of the examples of the ongoing work that we've been doing with some of the cities here in India. Um, uh, so because the work is ongoing, it has not been published. I've asked the name of the cities and the locations where we are working, uh, but I'll be happy to answer any questions any of you have. Um, just a basic uh, you know, start. This is also something similar to what Nikhil had presented. Uh, briefly, what is a climate action plan? Uh, it's a document which creates a framework for cities to address the causes and impacts of the climate change. It basically outlines actions to reduce or mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in coordination with other city level plans, for example, uh, development plans, transport plan, uh, plans, health plans, etc. It also outlines actions to address vulnerable city locations from flooding, drought, temperature fluctuations, species change caused by the climate change, among others. <laughs> City climate action planning will be effective only when identified prioritized solutions uh, are included in the annual municipal budget, something that Nikhil also spoke about, and in other relevant schemes. Basically, mainstreaming of the climate solutions into the development priorities of the city is an essential step to ensure that the climate action plan is successful. 
inclusive and equitable climate action plan should be the new normal to achieve more functional city it essentially means that you have to put people first during the planning for solutions in implementing the actions and distributing the uh, impacts of the solutions in an equitable manner in summary applying an equity lens while adopting actions that help mitigate and ad adapt to the impacts of climate change by ensuring that the needs of the vulnerable groups are met now <clears throat> cities are made up of dynamic uh, and complex social political economic and natural system and are best placed to deliver both climate action that is fair equitable and beneficial for all as cities grow it is increasingly critical for urban decision makers to create plans and enact policies to address climate change that prioritize at risk communities or vulnerable communities such as informal workers migrants women children people with disabilities among others first and foremost the inclusive planning and policy design can address the urban inequities Pre, uh, that are pre-existing uh, and, uh, and worsened by the climate change. Secondly, it is a, a must to be, uh, put people at the heart of the climate action planning process since the, uh, they possess the local knowledge and expertise of the communities. Thirdly, applying an equity lens to understand how certain communities are impacted by climate change, what existing social and economic barriers that they face and how this impacts their ability to benefit from the climate action. WRI, in partnership with C40, has co-developed inclusive plan, action planning toolkit. The toolkit helps cities ensure that the processes are rooted in genuine engagement of diverse set of stakeholders suffering from <coughs> inequality and the impacts of climate change. Policies are actively designed with people, fairness, and justice at the center of decision making. Clear mechanisms are identified for me measuring, monitoring, and evaluating both the direct impacts and the distribution of the impacts of the climate solutions. Uh, in view of this, we've partnered with several cities in India to help them develop their city level climate action plan in line with the requirement under the Climate Smart Cities Assessment Timber Clause 5. Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. We've used elements of the inclusive climate action planning in our ongoing work with the cities. We will now take a look at some of the findings that we've done. We basically adopted a four-step approach. As the first step, a city-level planning workshop was organized uh, sometime last year uh, in February 2020, just before we went into the lockdown. Uh, we saw the participations not just from the, the respective cities or departments that are responsible at the city level, but we also encourage participation from many state level departments who sometimes are the custodians of the uh, data or they are also the custodians of the policies or the implementation of certain actions in the urban areas. <clears throat> we used secondary research and uh, stakeholder consultations to map uh, institutional setup policy and regulatory environment, budgetary allocations, understand ongoing initiatives, looked at the socioeconomic profile of the different cities that we work with, identified key development priorities along with the key climate risk. The brainstorming workshop and the secondary research helped establish a local context for climate solution that needs to be mainstreamed into the development priorities. In the second step, extensive desk review of the CSEF reports, smart city proposals, government reports, and other documents was carried out to identify key issues and gaps in achieving the priorities. This has led to a developing of a bucket list of solutions for individual cities, which have been detailed in the draft climate action plans that we had submitted to the city. Now, all of this has happened after the lockdown, so everything sort of moved to a remote working and some of the challenges that are associated with the remote working, we also face those challenges. We are currently uh, in the middle of prioritization and sectoral pathway development. The stakeholder consultations are taking place to narrow the number of key solutions uh, for city climate strategies and sectoral pathways are ongoing. The inputs that we will receive through those consultations during the prioritization stage will help us developing and finalizing the uh, implementation plan under the city climate action plans. 
finally, uh, once we are able to finalize this DCAP along with the implementation plan, a final set of implementation document will be handed over to the cities. We are hoping that this exercise will be completed in the next couple of months. Now, as part of the first step uh, to establish the context or need, we also looked at in, in, the, in this particular case, one particular state, we also looked at, we, it's also important for us to understand how the state is growing and urbanizing. The economic growth rate of the state was the second highest in the country during FY13 to 17, at a, and it increased at a CAGR of 11% between 2015 uh, to 2021. The urban areas of the state accommodate roughly 20% of the state population, and the state is closely following the national trajectory of urbanization with a growth rate of 2.3% per annum. Given this trend, it is prudent that the cities need to create systems that provide a high quality of life for all, <clears throat> for all citizens, which needs a new vision of how to build and manage cities while also being resilient to the likely impacts of the climate change. Further, we looked at uh, the key climate risks faced by the cities. The urban areas in the state are prone to extreme climate-related weather events and face multiple climate risks, including heat waves, urban flooding, storm, and drought, among others. One of the city in the state is among the top 10 hottest cities in India with an average temperature at above 40 degrees Celsius. And in 2019, the temperature reached 49 degrees Celsius as well. Six out of the seven cities that we are working in this, uh, in this particular state have witnessed urban flooding in the recent years. Different cities in, uh, are also projected to face increasing instances of thunderstorms in the future. Some cities are expected to witness higher number of drought years an annual increase of two to three weeks per year in the next two decades is also projected. Some urban areas depend on water that is transported from a distance, making them vulnerable in the water sector as well. Such events are likely to worsen the situation in the near future as well. On the other hand, the total CO2 emissions in the state have grown by 65% between 2005 and 15 with a major contribution coming in from the energy sector. Some of the <clears throat> subsectors such as agriculture and commercial have nearly tripled. Transport emissions have grown 2.4 times and public electricity uh, generation emissions have nearly tripled. <clears throat> After developing the city context, the next step of the planning process focuses on the needs assessment. Identifying the needs helps answer the question, how might we tackle climate action based on the needs of our cities and citizens, and understanding the needs of various frontline communities, including women, informal workers, among others. As a next step in the needs assessment, uh, we looked at the analysis. We analyzed the inclusivity and equity implications of the potential climate solutions using action analysis database as part of the ITEP toolkit that I mentioned earlier. Uh, thirdly, based on the detailed action analysis database, the policy recommendations, and the need to build uh, to provide clear steps for a city to take in order to plan the actions in an inclusive way, have also been identified. Now, while identifying the needs, we looked at the state's vision, uh, which basically can be classified under three categories of economic, social, and environment. The state we work in is an agrarian state, as we know that urbanization in the state is closely following the national trend. Uh, the, urban, uh, the urban areas must provide equitable access to jobs that have positive economic impact on its citizens. And at the same time, the reliability of the service delivery must build resilience of the citizens. Under the environment section, solutions must promote climate friendly practices, including but not limited to revitalizing of the groundwater resources and management of waste disposal and water conservation. In summary, the climate solutions for cities in this particular state need to focus on emission reduction and air quality improvement amidst high energy emissions, with a growing focus on societal outcomes, considering rapid population growth. All this while ensuring positive impact on jobs and overall economy. Now, <clears throat> cities are engines of economic growth. A city's ability to act on climate will largely depend on its economic growth and the population size. 
we use this parameters to categorize cities into four types. This is where we created a typology or introduced an additional element in the traditional climate action planning process that is happening. What we've done is we've identified four types of cities. First is a thriving city, which has a high income today and a high ratio of projected growth in GDP per capita to projected growth in population between 2001 and 2020. Cities in this category are not only economically strong today, but their economic growth is also projected to outpace their urban population growth in the coming years. The next type is the emerging cities, which have a low GDP per capita today and a high ratio of a projected growth in GDP over the population growth between 2021 and 30. While their economic strength is low today, the predicted economic growth is greater than the projected population growth, indicating an in increase in the economic productivity over the next decade. The next type is the stabilizing cities, which have a high GDP per capita today, but a low projected growth in GDP. Uh, basically, it essentially means that the population growth in these cities will outpace the uh, income growth in these cities. The cities are economically stronger to, to today, but expected to have a lower economic growth relative to the population when compared to emerging or the private cities. The last type is the aspiring cities that have low GDP per capita today and a low ratio of uh, income growth relative to the population growth in the next decade. The cities are struggling because in the near future, they are likely to experience more rapid population growth than per capita income, uh, economic growth, pointing to an impending resource growth. <clears throat> we, in the next slide, uh, we will categorize the cities according to the typology that we discussed in the previous slide. On the x-axis, we have the ratio of uh, income growth, and on the y-axis, we have the population growth. At the point, uh, we've used the logarithmic scale to respond to the skewness to the higher values or the larger values. The point where both the axis cross is the India value. As we can see in 2020, over the last decade, City 1 and City 4 have stabilized, whereas City 3, 6, and 7 have demonstrated a high population growth. But as we move along in the next decade, in 2030, City 4 emerges as a, a thriving city. Basically, it's a military base. It has four ordinance factories. It has witnessed a phenomenal growth of garment manufacturing during the last 10 years. It employs more than 50,000 skilled workers in this particular sector. The city is also surrounded by rich mineral belt and 20,000 gauges of thick wood is processed uh, every day. The city also offers educational, uh, excellent educational facilities with six universities and 21 engineering college, uh, making it an educational hub. It also serves as a gateway to people uh, and ethnic tourism as well. Essentially, all of these activities means that the city's economic productivity will increase over the next decade. On the other hand, city three's economic growth will stabilize by 2030. However, its ratio of projected economic growth over population growth will be lower than that of a thriving city, that is city four. And city two's population growth will outpace its economic growth. Uh, let's now take a look at one simple sectoral analysis for all the seven cities that we've carried out. In this chart, uh, CSCL score is plotted on the x-axis while the y-axis shows annual electricity consumption per capita. Black bubbles are total electricity per capita per annum and RE per capita as yellow bubbles. The bubble size shows the population of this respective cities. Here's a simple piece of analysis. City 1 with a population uh, less than that of City 3 has a relatively higher electricity consumption um, of about uh, 900 kilowatt hour per capita per year, but lower RE penetration. We've seen that the City 1 is making efforts to improve the solar infrastructure in the city, but it needs to increase or accelerate its efforts to increase the portion of RE in its energy mix through citizen participation and promotion of growth of solar. On the other hand, amongst all the seven cities, City 2 has the highest per capita of party convention of 64 kilowatt hour per person per year. Overall, we find that all the seven cities in the state need to prioritize renewable energy within the city's energy needs. We've also identified several data issues while we were working with the cities. Our research and consultations revealed that uh, uh, the data reliability issues have, uh, have been identified that needs to be analyzed further. 
to deeper engagement with these cities. For example, city four that you see here, let me just show you. This is the city four here. The city four's population is twice that of either city six or city seven, but it's consuming half the electricity than that of city six or city seven. Uh, pointing to a, a gap in the way the data has been collected or computed in the cities here, uh, which, which basically indicates that cities will need hand holding support to address such data gaps. In summary, as the cities grow and develop, their electricity consumption is likely to grow as they aim to achieve their development priorities while they expand. The cities need to ensure higher renewable energy in their energy mix than what they have today along with several other uh, mechanisms that will also help them use the energy more effectively and more efficiently. Well, we have identified uh, solutions across the thematic areas, CSCF thematic areas for all the cities, but here's, uh, here it is a priority matrix where we look at you know, what are the top two or three priorities for different cities. For example, city one, which is a stabilizing city, its economic growth will remain stabilized over the next decade with rising population. Energy and waste are important priorities. Energy is a priority to do high per capita consumption with low RE penetration, while waste management becomes important as it generates 67 kg waste per capita per day. The solutions should focus on innovative business models to ensure zero dumping of waste lands fill and possibly converting waste to energy. I will not go through each and every city. Uh, as a final step, uh, we are currently in the process of finalizing this implementation plan for the cities. Because the mainstreaming of climate change into development priority requires coordination among multiple actors, institutions, and processes, the journey from a plan on paper to action on the ground can be slow. Drawing on published literature, case examples, and expert insights, WRI has identified five factors that can work together like a set of gears to help accelerate move from commitments and plans to implementation. Five components of work, uh, work together to bridge the implementation gap. Policy frameworks or political commitments, mandates, laws, and legislations made by the government to mainstream climate considerations into development plans or sectoral plans. Leadership or initiatives introduced and supported by political leaders, influential ministries, and other non-state actors to drive mainstreaming efforts. Information and tools for mainstreaming climate change and including learning initiatives, training, or access to knowledge and expertise. Coordination mechanisms such as interministerial steering committees or interdepartmental steering committees, task force designed to support mainstreaming efforts across policies and sectors and facilitate the public private coordination. And lastly, supportive financial processes such as expenditure tracking initiatives, budget tagging efforts and special funds set up by the government to support the mainstream efforts. During our exercise, uh, we also observed that cities face several common barriers. Some of them are, are listed here, for example, capacity and staffing. Cities may be broadly committed to climate action, but city staff are often unable to articulate a compelling case for individual projects or policies. Cities also need dedicated staff to move projects from idea to execution, they often have access to technical expertise to develop a program, but limited staff to guide projects, <coughs> which uh, causes the recurring delays, and it also limits the projects that can be identified at the city level. A robust community engagement as cities increase their focus on equity, community engagement becomes even more critical. It is important for cities to invest in engagement tools that help them reach populations and make their planning and implementation process more impactful and inclusive. Coordination cities may have demonstrated capacities to identify certain climate projects, but cities struggle to build buying from key agencies for execution or even accessing finance. Finance, uh, access to finance is a known barrier or a challenge. While there are several funding mechanisms available to support climate action, most exist at the national level. These funds are often competitive in nature and it can be harder for smaller cities to compete. There is an urgent need to develop a city climate finance fund to help cities with pre development activities. Finally, data availability and utilization. As we have seen in one of the slides earlier, data management is a challenge. Most importantly, many important data sets may be available, uh, 
uh, are are either not available or not being utilized by the state. This makes it difficult to prioritize or get the permit projects prioritized uh, during the reckoning process. There's barriers when overcome enables greater integration of various stakeholders uh, to not only plan for climate change, but also implement solutions in an inclusive and transparent manner. Thank you so much. I'll end my presentation here. Ankita, over to you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, there is a connection error. Am I audible? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, now you are. Great. Thank you. I missed out on the last part of it. Um, all right. So we can have we can proceed with a couple of uh, questions for the panel discussion. Um, my first question would be to uh, Nikhil. Um, since uh, you're working with uh, many cities for preparing the climate uh, action plan at city level, uh, but in India, we have uh, the state action plans and the national action plans. So in your experience, um, um, how are uh, states, what is the role of the state in promoting the cities to develop climate action plans? And um, um, how can these cities initiate the process if, if four cities, like you said, um, which had prepared, you gave examples. So if, uh, if any city wants to start the process of climate action planning, what would be the uh, first few steps that they should be taking? So, yeah, uh, thanks for this question. Uh, so coming to the first bit, I think, uh, like you indicated, uh, there is already a framework in the national action plan, uh, the NDC and the state action plans. And India's NDC also has quite a bit of urban focus. Uh, it's you know one of uh, sort of the top ranked uh, NDCs in terms of urban focus. So there is uh, that intent. Uh, with respect to the SAPCCs also, uh, there is a framework, but uh, yeah, in terms of uh, scope for improvement, I think uh, there are opportunities where uh, there can be, uh, you know, requirements that uh, cities in the state, so at least uh, important economic centers or uh, ones which are growing uh, faster, they do come up with uh, local level action plans, climate action plans. And uh, a key aspect is also that, uh, like Chirag, is, Chirag mentioned in his last slides, in terms of data management, that is also a key aspect where uh, we see that in different programs and schemes, uh, there is reporting happening, but all this is not linked. It uh, it goes to different departments and line ministries. And uh, like he mentioned that, that impacts uh, selection and prioritization of projects. Uh, so, you know, the comprehensive of your action plan. Uh, also, there are there is scope for uh, increased capacity building. Uh, again, a number of states uh, do have, you know, uh, very ambitious visions of uh, being carbon neutral, say, in, by 2040 or so. Uh, and a number of states have also taken actions in terms of climate uh, cells and knowledge management centers that they have. So such centers play a key role uh, in terms of, you know, uh, actually uh, ensuring that various uh, city officials and departments, they, they are conversant in terms of uh, what climate action means, what does planning for it mean. Uh, and this can, of course, happen gradually. Also, a link uh, to financing, if there can be climate considerations or climate criteria included in financing. So that will automatically ensure that you know projects which are implemented, they, uh, they sort of have climate benefits already uh, included. A number of these projects which are implemented actually do uh, help the climate, uh, but that's what the key thing is that uh, these uh, benefits are not always accounted for, or uh, they're not always uh, measured. Coming to the second part in terms of how do, or how do cities go about it? So I think it's important to realize that this is a process and uh, you know cities can take it on uh, based on their local capacity, local context at the pace that they are comfortable with. Uh, 
and uh, a key point that we have noticed in uh, not only these four cities but you know around 15 20 cities which do which we have supported is a uh, commitment from the leadership is really important because uh, that really gives a clear directive to various departments you know uh, that the city is serious about it uh, there will be uh, backing there will be resources there is enough will to uh, take climate action on and to implement it also ensuring uh, there is dedicated capacity uh, or you know dedicated teams and staff uh, again uh, uh, who are uh, deployed on this because uh, in our cities uh, our uh, municipal officers uh, do work a lot but then they have very uh, they have a number of other responsibilities so that's why they're ensuring that there is a dedicated uh, team uh, with the knowledge and with you know also the time to take this on is important uh, yeah and i think as a final uh, takeaway i would say uh, yeah, it's important that cities do start on it, uh, but like I said, they they don't need to start uh, full fledged or you know it does not. Uh, it's a process, so it uh, it depends on the city's capacity and context. But uh, yeah, these are some of the points that would help uh, cities uh, kick off the process and ensuring that multiple departments and stakeholders are engaged early on. That helps because. Uh, you know, in cities which do have second, third generation action plans now, it always started slow, but there was a wider engagement of officers, of uh, stakeholders. And now uh, it, uh, climate change and action is sort of in their regular work. They, uh, they speak about it, they integrate it, uh, they're looking to consider it in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, uh, Chirag, would you like to add on to any of those points for the questions? Uh, thanks, Ankita. Uh, I think uh, Nikhil has covered a number of things. So I'll just add a few different elements to what he has captured. Um, just going back a little bit, National Action Plan on Climate Change, one of the missions that it has focuses on uh, uh, creating knowledge management centers at the state level. Right. And NAPCC, when it came out in 2009 and 10, that became a sort of a document to drive the actions at the state level in India. And that's after that document, a lot of uh, states came up with the uh, nodal agencies with the support of the Department of Science and Technology, who was in charge of that question. And they started working on the uh, uh, state action plans on climate change and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at that journey that the states have, okay, where they started after 2009 and then, I think cities in India, barring few cities who have had some help from the consultants, most of the other cities in India are at the same stage. The Climate Smart Cities Assessment Framework has come up, which is driving the climate actions in the urban India. It is providing a framework to drive the climate action. It is very focused. It doesn't burden the city with too many things, it identifies the five thematic areas in which the city needs to talk about the climate action. And as they build their capacity, I think there is a scope to include or scale up the climate action in the city level. So there is an element of experience which is available at the state level. And this is what the cities need to bank on, the national experience and the state experience in implementing their own climate solutions. So I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thank you. That is really important that there's a linkage uh, between the previous uh, state action plans and the national action plan. Um, so uh, my question for you, Chirag, um, would be what, um, how could you bring um, probably more coherence in the state action plans and city action plans, probably uh, from your own experience right now, as you shared that your, your plans um, they are under process. So how did you go about in bringing that coherence as much as possible? Yeah, th thanks for the question. Very important question. Again, uh, I'll take, I'll carry forward the example that I gave. So when the first SAPCCs were developed, the focus was on adaptation. It was 100% adaptation focus. Now, when the states are revising their state action plans on climate change, 
we can actually see the difference. We've been in, uh, uh, we've been supporting several states in India regarding that process, and we've seen from the previous exercise to the current exercise what is the difference. There are a lot many departments and stakeholders which are now involved in the process. Uh, a review happens, inputs are considered, and uh, the actions are refined. It now includes both adaptation as well as mitigation component and in the state action plan on climate change. And uh, the strategies are formed on addressing the climate related issues which are impacting the state. Okay. Now coming to the city level, <clears throat> when cities are developing this climate action plan, in our case, uh, the eight or 10 cities that we are supporting right now, our engagement isn't only with the city. Our engagement is also at the state level. So we have a we have been in touch with, or we have been engaging with the state nodal agency on climate change. We've been engaging with the urban development department at the state level. And then we've been also engaging with the uh, cities at the city level so that there is a coherence that is brought from right from the beginning. Now, what it does is whenever the states but the state nodal agencies are responsible for SAPCC. They're able to bring in the SAPCC angle when we are working on the climate action plan at the city level. The urban development department is able to bring in the urbanization angle into the city level climate action plan. And there is a national framework which is available. So there is a synchronization of different efforts happens from different governance levels. This is the way we are approaching and this is where the ICAP toolkit that we have, includes the Climate Action Planning Toolkit, that helps us identify which are the impacted groups over and above the uh, government stakeholders, what are the citizen groups, what are the communities that are impacted, and how do we engage with those communities to ensure that this identification of the solution is inclusive in nature. We use the local knowledge which is available. Right? Most of the time what has happened is consultants come in, prepare the plan, and they go out. So there is no ownership at the city level or any other level. I think that is something we need to create, and that is what we are hoping to create through the exercise that we are doing. Thank you. That was quite insightful, and probably will take one of the questions also. I think uh, uh, I can maybe ask it right now, because you mentioned stakeholders. Um, and um, so uh, basically, uh, who are the key stakeholders involved and um, um, how do you basically engage stakeholders at various stages, considering you also mentioned that this time due to the pandemic, it has been a little bit um, difficult to engage. So what kind of uh, maybe um, steps you took to ensure that uh, stakeholder, all stakeholders are engaged? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a bit tricky question to answer. The reason is no matter uh, how many number of stakeholders I say, I'll always miss out on somebody, right? So the simple answer is that everyone is a stakeholder who is impacted by the activities that are happening in a particular city. But just to put uh, things into the context, I think city level officials are definitely city engineers, uh, people who are the custodian of the data that will inform the uh, uh, city inventory development or identification of the vulnerability or hotspots within the city, they are very important. Sometimes the data lies at the state or the national level. So you'll have to identify the list of agencies that, that will be, uh, that you need to reach out to. Sometimes it's some of the private uh, companies. For example, few cities have uh, private uh, electricity generators, uh, right? Uh, who supply the electricity to the city. So they become your stakeholders. Uh, uh, transport bodies, uh, both at, at the state level, as well as at the regional level, as well as at the urban level also becomes important. Then there are citizen groups who work in the city on various issues that are very particular, uh, very important to that particular cities. And of course, the citizens themselves are, are very important. Um, in the absence of, uh, I mean, our travel is restricted, right? Even the pandemic is still going on. Uh, so it's difficult to engage with each and every one. To the extent possible, we try to uh, reach out to as many people as possible over email, uh, but that limits your ability to take inputs and assess the impacts that is going to happen on the outside. So whenever it is possible, 
you keep a room open to engage with the stakeholder groups at a later point in time as well. The climate action plan is not a one-time exercise. It's a exercise. You identify the current status, you identify when you need to be in the long term, identify the actions that will take you to the long run, and evaluate your progress periodically and do course correction. So it's an ongoing exercise. You have to keep room open for the engagement at a later point in time as well. Thank you. Uh, indeed, that is a, a question, quite a tricky question. But yes, um, I have one um, last question for Nikhil. Um, uh, this is actually for both, but we'll first go to uh, go to Nikhil. Um, so, from your experience of working in uh, preparing climate action plans, can you highlight uh, three key things or three key steps that cities must do to uh, adopt, uh, need to adopt for enabling um, the preparation of the city climate action plan as well as the implementation? So, uh, yeah. Uh, taking a cue from the previous uh, question, I think, uh, like Chirag also mentioned, stakeholder engagement is really critical and ensuring that uh, linkage and convergence with the uh, state departments, like he was saying, uh, UDD, uh, transport department, etc., because uh, that is where, in terms of infrastructure and development, a lot of planning and uh, funding is linked. Uh, so ensuring such stakeholders and also other stakeholders are engaged uh, because that really implies uh, your action plan will be successful. So just to give an example, uh, if you engage real estate developers and architects, for example, and if buildings and energy is, an, uh, is a focus area, once you consult with them, you will get insights and perspectives, you know, uh, that why certain solutions are being uh, taken up or maybe what are the barriers for certain solutions, which would uh, then help you identify specific actions that you can take uh, and, you know, not just uh, include actions in your action plan for the sake of it, uh, but have uh, something that has more chances of success. Uh, similarly, uh, maybe if you engage with community groups or NGOs or technical institutes, they might have a better understanding of, uh, let's say, why public transport uh, or non-motorized uh, infrastructure is not working uh, for a certain set of people. Uh, so these, uh, so engagement and consultation with stakeholders in, is important, uh, ensuring that uh, you know key decision makers uh, and also groups more or less to uh, ensure that your effort is streamlined. If you can reach out to groups and associations, that helps. Uh, this will just give you quick inputs. You know, instead of doing a detailed study, uh, and this gives local, this draws on local knowledge. Another key aspect is uh, like. Uh, I mentioned in my presentation, uh, ensuring linkage uh, and alignment with existing plans and projects. Uh, so to actually identify, uh, you know, where the city is building infrastructure, what type of infrastructure is it building? And then to assess that, okay, can I add on uh, elements to this, which enhance uh, the climate benefits? So that has a higher chance of success rather than uh, you know proposing something which is completely out of the blue for the city. Uh, and accordingly, you can of course uh, there is uh, there is scope and you should always be ambitious and pro uh, propose innovative technologies and solutions. But you can uh, scale these accordingly. Uh, so I think these two and uh, like I said. Uh, in my previous uh, responses, commitment from the senior level and also ensuring that there's a uh, dedicated capacity. Uh, these are some of the important things. Thank you. Uh, is there anything you would like to add, Chirag? Um, any three key points that city should keep in mind? Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll talk about five key points. One of the slides that I presented about mainstreaming years. Uh, so political leadership or leadership at the city level or any other level is very important. Uh, identifying the coordination mechanisms. Climate action plan has to be implemented by uh, or implemented in coordination with multiple agencies. Right? So you need to have buy-in from multiple departments. Uh, you also need to build the capacities or knowledge uh, you know, so that each revision of the climate action plan 
is rooted in the science as well as it reflects the current circumstances uh, that the city is facing. And then uh, uh, the financing becomes an important aspect as well. So those five gears are something I would definitely recommend for all the cities to look into, or rather any region or any